Uh, well, again, welcome everyone this morning. It is truly good to see you. I really mean that. I don't just say that every week. Like, I really enjoy seeing you all. Um, last week, we were at Ephesians uh, 4, 17 through 24. Uh, and we looked at this diagram up here. So for those of you who weren't here, I'll just take a minute to explain. Uh, you've sort of got the two spheres, the old humanity, the new humanity, which represent sort of realms of existence. Uh, that black line, horizontal line running through the center is, uh, think of a timeline. So on the left, you've got creation, uh, and on the right, you've got whatever the end of creation, whenever that is. Um, the cross and the cloud, right where the, the green circle uh, sort of intersects the timeline in the brown circle, uh, you've got the cross, right? Because at the cross and the resurrection is when Jesus inaugurates a new creation, a new humanity, a new race, I guess, of people, right? And so uh, those who follow him are now part of a new humanity, a new creation, right? We live, we have died to the old, old realm, right? At our baptism, we were plunged in the waters and we die, um, cease to exist, and then we are reborn into a new, ro- a new world, a new realm, uh, a new real but metaphysical reality, right? Uh, And then the cloud there right next to the left of new um, represents Jesus' return. So at his return, the old humanity will finally be done away with and the new will take over. Uh, And so we talked about that and said our our fundamental identity must be Christian, right? We We are died to everything that is not Christ and we are reborn into Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean we escape from the world. It means... Uh, we rescue the world, right? Uh, the new humanity is not some otherworldly existence. It is an existence here in this world uh, in which we live in a way that is Christ-shaped rather than um, worldly-shaped. Uh, today, we are going, well, Paul is going to give us some practical examples of what that will look like. What does it look like to inhabit this new humanity? Um, before we get into that, what I thought I'd do is just take a, a oh, somebody's got their phone on. <laughs> uh, I thought what I'd do is just take a few minutes um, and explain where I'm coming from. Um, so there's, um, from what I'm, what I'm gathering, I, there's some uh, misconstruals both in our community and, and at culture at large that I want to clear up. Um, sometimes we get this out of um, movies, uh, pop culture, uh, the news, everywhere. That this idea that clergy are somehow different or better than the rest of the world and that we somehow look down on everybody else, right? And that we're just... Uh, because it's you sell more papers or more clicks, right? If you put an angry preacher on your newspaper rather than a good one, um, right? You, this, this idea that somehow um, clergy are all angry at us. Um, let me clear the air. I have no ill feelings toward any of you at all. Like some of you, I know some deep nasty secrets because you shared them with me. No one in this room. I'm trying to look you all in the eye right now. There is no ill will in me toward any of you. I don't wish any of you harm. I'm not angry at any of you. I don't think that I'm somehow elevated above or better than any of you. Um, In no way should you come to me and confess, like you meet me in my office or wherever, and you say, hey man, I got this deep, dark secret, and you tell me, that will not change my opinion of you. In fact, it would boost my respect because you were courageous enough right, to confess your sin and to do something about it. Uh, if you bring to me some deep, dark secret, I'm not going to throw you out. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm going to tear open my heart and pour out my blood and do whatever I can to help you rebuild and to help you move out of that and into faithfulness. All right, so I have no ill will toward anyone in here I don't think you are all condemned. Um, I, I don't stand in judgment over you. Uh, I, like, I, I like you. 
<laughs> I do. I love you all. I, so, again, there's not a single person in this room to whom I have any ill feelings. All right? There are times uh, some of you frustrate me, right? Clear, but I, that doesn't, it's not like I go home and I'm just, oh, I hate that person. And I, I, I hope they, you know, God will throw lightning at them or something. All right? Never has that crossed my mind. All right? No. Um, yeah. All right, so my job is to try and represent to you Jesus. Um, and nowhere in there is there condemnation, judgment, spurning, any of that, all right? Um, likewise, let me also throw out, uh, when, I, when I do a sermon and I throw out an illustration, never do I have a specific person in mind. All right, let me throw that up. Um, I have specific patterns of behavior in mind, but if... Like, for example, if I talk about an illustration, and in the illustration there's a brick house, like, and I ate dinner at your house that week, and you have a brick home, it doesn't mean I'm talking about yours. <laughs> Every house around here is brick, all right? <laughs> so if I bring up your, your, a house or a garage or a vehicle or whatever, it doesn't mean I'm talking about you specifically or that I'm trying to single any one person out. Or if there's a particular pattern of behavior that you inhabit, um, I'm not talking about, I mean, I might be talking about you, but not only you, right? I bring it up because I've noticed it as a pattern either in our church or in culture at large, all right? You can bet your week's worth of wages that if I bring up a destructive pattern of behavior, it's because I saw it in myself first, right? Because I was reading the text, and in my office, I was like, oh, man, guilty, right? And so in no way do I stand above you or apart from you or in any way think that you're all sinners and I'm not, all right? Um, I stand in and among you, and when I use examples or illustrations, usually it's because I noticed sinfulness in my own heart first, all right? So I just want to clear the air on that, because um, we're going to talk about honesty today, um, being honest with each other, not letting the sin go down on our anger. Um, so I want to bring that out, throw that out there, um, at some point in here, I'll probably get frustrated during the sermon because I'm trying to be honest. Right? I'm trying to communicate with you my frustration, um, not with specific individuals, just with culture at large and how it's inhabited our church and, and my own wickedness. All right? So I'm trying to be honest. I'm trying to open up dialogue right? every week. I put my phone number, my email. Um, you can try and Facebook me, but I check it. The not ever. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm usually in my office at least Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5, usually Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. If you call me, I will meet you at 4 in the morning at Frankie J's for coffee. All right. I'm trying, I'm trying to be honest and I'm trying to open up a dialogue with you. Right. So if you've got, if I've done something to offend you, please let me know. All right. So I can correct it because. Well, we'll get into it, but what happens is if we're not honest and if we just let anger simmer and stew, um, one small thing here doesn't get addressed, which leads to another small thing, and then, you know, after a year or so, we've just got this anger that's been simmering beneath the surface, um, and what started off as a mist has now turned into, like, this thick stew of, of anger, right? Um, so if I've contributed to that, please let me know. All right, um, channels are open. I don't know how much more open I can be, all right? Um, all right, so with that said, let's, let's get into the text. Uh, I say 25 through 32. We'll probably get 25 through 26. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to hold you over on, on time, all right? So we'll just we'll take it slow. So 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are... Right, so Paul, in this passage, he's going to give a pattern. He's going to say, put off this, put on this, and then he'll give a reason why. All right, so put off falsehood, put on truth, and then I'll underline the reason why. Because we are all members of one body. Because we are all members of one body. All right. So now this statement is countercultural. Right? It's not 
it's different than the world we inhabit, right? So if I look out at, uh, how do I phrase it? Let me just phrase this. If we look at general Western sort of global consumerist culture, which is heavily prevalent, prevalent in the nation we inhabit, right? So I'm not, I'm not talking, singling out America specifically or anything like that. Um, it drives me nuts that I have to qualify every statement, but it's public speaking, so you do. Um, just the general broad pattern area that we inhabit, okay? I know there are exceptions to every rule. Generalization, you get, it? You get the idea? All right. Um, broad scale pattern. What we have in the place of creation that we inhabit um, is this attitude that why would I do something or attend something if it doesn't benefit me, right? Every part of our culture, most parts of our culture, are geared toward this, right? Um, this, this is the message of, of every Disney movie, or at least most of them, right? There's usually some uh, young kid, prince, or a princess, or whoever, right? Uh, they're an individual, and their parents and their community are oppressing them, right? Uh, they're forcing on them these norms that they don't want to inhabit. So then the hero of the story, what do they do that's brave and courageous? Well, they throw off all of these norms. They say, forget you, mom and dad. I'm going to rebel. I'm going to go do my own thing. Right? Isn't that the plot line of Disney? Right? That's, that's a very individualistic idea. Right? That if, if my community is not fostering me, if it's not helping me achieve my goals, then I need to shake them off and I need to go do my own thing. Right? Every commercial tells you, hey, we have produced this product. If you buy this product, then you will be happy and complete and, and your life will go well, right? If you don't buy this product, right, and then what we do, we show happy people, right, every drug commercial is the same. You just find some good looking people and they smile while you run your ad in the, they're smiling in the background and you tell about your terrible side effects in the foreground. Uh, <laughs> some of them are really bad too, like, why would you ever take this drug? The side effects are worse. But. Uh, anyways, right, so we, we live in a world that is inhabited, right, uh, one person, one vote, right, everything about us is, is geared toward the individual. That doesn't mean that you, the individual, don't matter. It doesn't mean that individualism is wrong, right? It doesn't mean that at times there aren't, the community isn't oppressing you and imposing these norms that you should rebel against, right? There are times when that's true, right, but our culture tends to go far over to the one side, right? I think Paul is trying to pull at least his community back, right? To say that, no, let me also say, this idea of individualism, why would I do something if I don't benefit, that has deeply, deeply infected the church, the church at large. Uh, and I would argue it's probably prevalent in our church as well, right? Um, for example, why would I attend a church event if I'm not going to benefit from it? Yet we treat church like we treat movies or television because it's the air, air we breathe, right? Um, so, some so and so is putting on an event. Um, it doesn't really interest me, so I'm not going to go, right? Because I don't get a benefit. So, if uh, uh, let me think of an example that's not personal. Um, I don't know. Uh, suit. No, we have a suit. Uh, Jennifer, but she's a. She's not a Jennifer in our church. All right, <laughs> just random name. I'm trying to think of. All right, so Jennifer is putting on an event. Uh, for. Uh, she's she's doing a garage sale. All right, Jennifer is doing a garage sale at church, and she's trying to get everyone involved in the church, right, to to take part in her garage sale, right. But I don't have any old junk laying around. It's not true. I have plenty of old junk laying around. <laughs> Pretend I don't, or at least I love my junk and I don't want to sell it, right? So <laughs> uh, I don't have any old junk. I don't want to put any in the garage sale. Um, so why would I go? Like, why would I take part? I know it's a church function. I, I know Jennifer's my friend or whatever. It's part of our church. But I'm not going to, I gain no benefit from it. So why would I go to the garage sale? Why would I attend, right? Paul would say, no. You, you go to that event. I don't care if you like it. I don't care if you're bored for two hours. 
right? You go because you, you belong to Jennifer, right? So we don't lie, speak the truth because we belong to one another, right? So, so y'all over here on this side, you're, you're slaves to them. And, and you guys over here, you're, you're slaves to them, right? And y'all, y'all in the front half, you're slaves to the people behind you, right? And, and I'm a slave to you. And <laughs> that sounds weird. You are slaves to me. That sounds weird. Um, right? No, we, we belong to each other, right? And so, yeah, right? So just the idea, um, we belong to each other. And so since I belong to you, and I belong to you. I'm not going to lie to those people over here, right? And I'm not going to engage in, in behaviors to, that's going to hurt these people over here, right? And, and if Jennifer or Stacy or Susie or whoever throw, sorry, we have Stacy, uh, whoever throws some event and I don't want to go, well, I'm still going to go, even if I gain no benefit from it, because she's my friend, right? And I've thrown a lot of events in the past and had nobody show up, and it's a terrible feeling. Right, so for her sake, I'll go, right? Because I, I belong to her, right? And it, if my behavior over in this area of life is going to negatively impact that person, well, I'm not going to do it because I, I belong to that person. And likewise, I know that they won't do that because they belong to me, and so they won't hurt me. Right, it's a lofty ideal. We fall short often, um, but that's the idea, right? So... So don't lie, tell the truth, because we are members of one another, members of one body. Uh, This next one, in your anger, do not sin. I'll I'll just throw this out there so you're not blindsided someday. There's a bit of um, that phrase, in your anger, which is what NIV or New International Version does with it. It's a bit confusing in the Greek. Uh, It's actually, the, the way that that word anger is set up is a imperative, which is a command. <laughs> so literally, it reads, be angry. But it sounds weird. We don't know what to do with it. So we say, make it sound like, if you are angry, then don't sin. Uh, the one way to make sense of that is, be angry at sin, and don't let it have a place in your community. Um, but that sort of contrasts with the, so maybe a church discipline type thing. But it, it sounds weird, because Coming up, we're going to see, don't, don't let, leave any room for anger or bitterness. Um, but it's there. Most people go with, in your anger, don't sin. So that's what we'll do with. So in your anger, do not sin, right? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. That's hard, isn't it? Right, especially, again, broad general pattern in suburban, rural, kind of middle class America, right? We are very uncomfortable with conflict. Unless it's over the radio, then we're good, right? Or the news, then it's, it's, we're pretty happy. Um, right, but we're, uh, at least on, a, on an interpersonal level, right, we don't like conflict, most of us. And so what do we do? Well, you've offended me. Well, I'm just going to be quiet. Right? I'm going to internalize this anger, and I'm just going to move on and get over it. Right? That in itself is not a terribly bad behavior. right? And it, it's probably a good idea for most things that, well, for light stuff. right? So if you said something, and I know you didn't mean it, um, or... It was just a little off comment. It was a one-time thing. I didn't let that go, right? But what happens is we take that, which is a good idea sometimes, and we put that out. We inhabit that behavior for every time someone offends us. Right? And then what happens is we internalize, and that anger just starts to simmer and brew. And when that happens, there's a division in our community. Right? Paul envisions we here, we are a new humanity. We are supposed to be united. We are supposed to be one body, right? But all of a sudden, that anger comes down, right? And the right arm starts rebelling against the left arm, and then it simmers, right? And it simmers. And because we let the sun go down, now there's a break. The devil, he's now got ground in our community, right? But what would it look like 
if we didn't do that, right? It's, it would be hard, it would be difficult, it would be scary, but it would be better, right? So what if instead of, and again, I'm trying to be as, as honest as I can. Like, when we offend each other, this includes me, right? I know I've done stuff that is just grating on some of you, all right? I don't know what it is, though, because no one ever tells me, right? Because we just, we dig it down, we internalize, and we let, we just, it just simmers under there, right? So what if instead of letting it simmer, we actually did what the Bible said, and we didn't let the sun go down on our anger, right? What if we actually trusted someone enough? What if we actually trusted our neighbor enough uh, and trusted that they would be mature enough to handle the conflict? Right, because oftentimes that's what I do. In my arrogance, someone's offended me, and I say, man, I would like to address that, but they're, they're just not mature enough to handle it. <laughs> that's just arrogance on my part, right? How dare I say that about that person, right? That's just judgmental, it's, that's bigotry, right? But what if instead I approach from a position of humility and weakness and I say, hey, you know, man, you said something the other day and you know, I don't know if you meant it or not, but can you, can you tell me maybe why you said that or, or what you meant by that? Because it, it really, you know, it got under my skin and it's been kind of ping-ponging in my head for the last three days. You know, can you tell me, can we try and work that out? Right? And sometimes the other person might just be like, baby, get over it. That would be the wrong response. It happens, right? But, some, right? but it, just maybe, since we are Christians in this place, we might respond like Jesus and also from humility and weakness say, hey, I'm sorry, man, this is what I meant. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to say that. Um, or, no, I, I kind of did mean that, but I didn't know it would offend you. I'm, like, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll do my best to avoid that behavior in the future, right? But if we don't do that, well, then it just brews and it simmers, and then two years from now, we'll, we'll have gained no ground, and there will just be these hatreds that are stewing under the surface, right? And I say this now, knowing full well that there are plenty of these little rivalries between us brewing underneath the surface, right? Don't tell me they're not there. Maybe somebody, all right, if you're a newer family here, uh, thankfully you, you may, may not have encountered them, right? But you guys that have been here for years, you know there's rivalries. You know there's dissension. You know we're not unified. What if maybe, just maybe, and I know because you've all told me. That's not Christian. That's not godly. We are failing to accurately represent Jesus. We are not being a good church when we do that, right? When there's divisiveness. Because for years, we have let the sun go down on our anger. And I know a lot of you are looking at me like, nah, young kid, what does he know, right? Forget that. I don't care what you think about me. I, read the Bible. <laughs> That's what it says. I didn't make this up. I'm just telling you what it says. I didn't write this. If I wrote this, it would have been, no, just ignore it. Let it go but I didn't write the Bible, which is a good thing. I just read it and then tell you about it, right? So what if maybe, just maybe, we actually inhabited what the Bible said and we didn't let the sun go down, right? If you don't know where to start, just pick me. <laughs> I'm sure at some point I'll do something to offend someone, right? I know I already have, right? So start with me. Use me as a test subject, right? And then, then maybe address your neighbor from there. All right? So we, we belong to each other. When we are unified, when we stick together and there genuinely is no division or divisiveness among us, then we represent Jesus. And if you don't think, Paul writes this because there's division. He doesn't just write for the sake of it. Right? Imagine for just a second, imagine the early church. You've got Jews and Gentiles. For years, the Gentiles, they've grown up their whole life, and all they know is those people hate me, right? It'd be like, and you've got the way that the, the structure is set up, you, you've got rich, you've got slaves in the church right next to these rich aristocrats who own slaves, right? Treating these slaves as these subhuman people, right? But the beauty of the Lord's Supper is that 
At the same meal, you have slave right next to rich aristocrat. You have valuable member of society, highly esteemed, honorable, next to worthless, on par with a, with a cow person, right? Those two, they have to get along, right? So, I mean, if you think this is an easy command, Paul's just taking this lightly, no. This is huge. We at least have the benefit that most of us at least hold the same general status in society. Right? They didn't even have that, and they have to overcome that. Right? I mean, imagine taking from 100 years ago, right, black slave with white owner in the deep south, and then making, them, making the white owner serve a meal to the black slave. I mean, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's huge. When Jesus washes the feet, God himself humbling, washing the feet, and that's huge. So these are, these are big, massive issues, but we have to do them. We have to address them. And I cannot do them for you. I can't, all I can do is beg you and hope and pray that we will do this. Um, but if we will, then we'll, we'll be able to claim the title Christian. We will be able to claim the title church, right? And in in 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, right, we'll know, hey, we're doing well, right? We're being faithful. So speak the truth, don't lie, and when offense and anger comes up, which is guaranteed to happen when you get at least one sinner in a room, we got to address it. We got to bring it up, right? You can bury it sometimes. You bury it every time and the devil's going to get footholds and we will not represent uh, Jesus well. We'll be living in the old humanity rather than the new. And I'm going to call it there for the day. Uh, We'll get to the next verses uh, at a later week. All right. Would you pray with me? Uh, Jesus... What you're asking us to do in these texts is very difficult. It goes against our culture. It goes against our instincts. It goes against the way we were lived. It's hard and it's difficult. And oftentimes, truth is far harder than a lie and darkness seems far more inviting than light. But if we will step into the truth, if we'll do the hard work, if we will step into the light and we let our eyes adjust, we will see a glory that we have never experienced before. And we will truly experience your kingdom, your joy, your new humanity. And so I just beg you that we would have the courage to do this. And I beg you for faithfulness. We love you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.